Hi, I'm Veronica Goodman, PPI's Director of Social Policy, and joining me today is Professor Aaron Chalpin of the Department of Criminology at the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on the costs and benefits of policing, place-based crime prevention, and the determinants of crime victimization. Timely research, given that last year the U.S. saw the biggest increase in the murder rate in decades, even as the overall crime rate has declined. In D.C., where I live and work, we've witnessed a rash of murders this year, and we're on track to exceed the number from last year if we haven't done so already. So uh, given that context, Aaron, why don't you please share a little bit about your background and, and research on crime? Sure, thanks, Veronica. So um, I'm an assistant professor of criminology at the University of Pennsylvania, where uh, I've taught for five years. Um, prior to joining uh, the faculty at Penn, I worked at an organization called the University of Chicago Crime Lab. Uh, and when I worked at the Crime Lab, I worked closely with policymakers uh, in New York City uh, on research and data analysis related to public safety. Uh, I'm a PhD from a school of public policy uh, from, from UC Berkeley, and I got my start doing crime research working for the Urban Institute, which is a DC uh, think tank uh, that does research on, on crime and public safety and, and lots of other uh, important policy issues. Um, so uh, all in all, I've been uh, doing crime research for around 15 years now. Uh, I've worked in a lot of different areas, uh, done research on immigration and immigration enforcement, capital punishment, uh, but really the, the lion's share of my recent work focuses on policing, um, the effectiveness of, of policing and, and various policing strategies. Great. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned before, there's been a lot of news coverage recently about the increase in crime, specifically the murder rate. Um, can you please talk a little bit about uh, what you're seeing, what, what the data is telling us or maybe not telling us? Sure. So. Um, so starting in around March of 2020, right, when the pandemic really hit our shores and, and the, the lockdowns uh, began, um, you know, homicides are now up uh, by around 40% nationally. Uh, so they went up by 25% in 2020, which is the largest single year increase uh, that we have uh, since we started keeping those statistics well. Uh, and it's up maybe another 15% this year um, so far. Um, so these are, are large increases. Uh, they've been observed in almost every large US city, but also most smaller cities as well. Uh, so this is really a, a national trend. Um, and maybe we could think about a little bit of historical perspective here. So um, when we think about uh, the homicide rate in the US over the last 60 years, uh, the current rate is somewhere between six and six and a half homicides per 100,000. We still have a little bit of uncertainty about this because uh, the numbers uh, don't get updated in real time, uh, but somewhere between six and six and a half murders per 100,000 people living in the United States. So back in 2014, um, this is when the homicide rate had hit sort of a recent trough. Uh, the rate was around 4.3 per 100,000. So the homicide rate is up uh, by around 50% since that time period. And, and so, you know, that's a real increase. Um, this, I, I don't think this is just alarmism. Um, you know, this is something that that is is being noticed, uh, and not just by people who who read the news. Um, at the same time, the homicide rate is nowhere near the historical high, at least in most cities. So, uh, nationally, the historic peak was around 10 homicides per hundred thousand in, in 1980. Uh, we're again just a little bit over six right now. So, um, we're we're not quite back to the bad old days yet, and and I don't think um, you know rhetoric should reflect that. Um, but we, we have wiped out at least 20 years of, of progress in, in uh, creating these homicide declines. Um, so that's something that I think is important to reflect on. Uh, so the increases in violence, as, as many might expect, um, are concentrated in a relatively small number of neighborhoods within cities. Um, these are the neighborhoods where violence had been endemic prior to the pandemic. It's just worse now. Um, and chances are, you know, most of your listeners probably are living in communities where they're not really noticing homicides go up. You know, these increases are, are concentrated in the most disadvantaged communities where people uh, tend to be poor and stuck in place. Um, and so that is one important feature um, also of what's happening. Uh, then finally, one thing I think we need to point out is we, we talk a lot about the murders and shootings, which are up. These are the most socially costly crimes. Um, so I think it makes sense that they drive the news, the news cycle. But overall, crime is not up. 
Um, since people started spending less time at work and more time at home, uh, things like street crimes and thefts are actually uh, down during the pandemic. Uh, one exception is motor vehicle theft, which is uh, up by quite a bit in most, most cities. So sort of sum up, the homicides are up by, by a lot, the shootings are up by a lot, other crimes are, are either steady or, or down. Um, and, and so I guess with all of that in mind, uh, are there any discernible causes? Um, do you think driving that those increases can, can we even sort of get to, to the causes of what might be happening? I've seen um, researchers point to a, a number of things in a speculative way at this point, um, you know, sort of a confluence of the pandemic and, and um, sort of uh, just the way that it's influenced life and um, some measures of economic well-being. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to give you a, a reasonably brief answer. Right? I, you know, we could probably talk for hours about this, but you know, I, I guess to start off, let me just say that I think the only intellectually honest answer someone can give you is that we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably won't ever know for sure. Um, a lot of things changed at the same time um, in the months following the start of the pandemic. Um, and there's just no way to sort out, right, what the most important drivers have been with, with, cert uh, with certainty. So. It's likely to be more than one thing. It's probably a mix of factors. It's probably um, a different set of ingredients in 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 some, you know in every city. Uh, so you know I think we should try to get comfortable with the fact that there probably isn't one simple silver bullet explanation for what we're seeing. Um, you know so so I think you know if you look at Twitter and you, you read some op eds, you would say well you know people on the left say it's obviously the pandemic, and people on the right say it's obviously the protests. Um, my, my own reaction as, as a researcher and someone who looks at the data, and I, I think this reflects the views of a lot of my colleagues who do the same, is that it's, it's not obvious at all what's causing this. Um, it really is very complex. Crime in general is a very complex phenomenon. Um, so, you know, we just have to embrace uncertainty. That being said, I think that there's some theories that we can rule out as, as at least important drivers, um, and then other theories that we, we can't. And, um, I'll try to set the stage for, for what we, we know and maybe what we still don't know best I, best I can. Um, so here's what we, we do know right now. Um, so when the pandemic hit our shores, the lockdowns began, most crimes fell by a lot, right? So street crimes were down by 30, 40, 50% in some cities um, because routine life was, was disrupted. But unlike other crimes, the murders didn't go down. The murders mostly held steady or maybe increased by a little bit in some cities. And so this, this was our first hint that there's something different about murder, right? That the world changed in just incredible ways that, that none of us have ever um, experienced before, right? And the murders just seem to be pretty sticky, right? And, and so why is that? Um, and that's something that we, we have to um, really grapple with. So, you know, shortly after the pandemic began, um, the police did begin to begin to pull back. Um, they cut down on, on unnecessary street stops and arrests. And this is for public health reasons, right? Um, this is way before any, any protests. Uh, the criminal justice system responded by reducing uh, the jail population because, um, you know, there's a, a fear, right? A prag pragmatic fear that, that jails could feel the spread of this virus. And so, this isn't about progressive politics, this is just pragmatism. Um, so this is also changing around the same time. Um, so this is sort of the background, right? And so, you know, one, I, I think really obvious theory here is that the rise in violence happens um, because of the pandemic, right? Um, the stresses and the strains of the pandemic, uh, things like lost loved ones, uh, lost jobs, uh, working from home in cramped apartments while your kids go to school, uh, the shutting down of schools, right? And community centers, the disruption of social services. Um, you know, all of these things uh, were obviously gonna be very, very salient for people, especially uh, poorer people who live in communities that don't have a lot of resources. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, it's obvious, right? That something like this could have big uh, impacts. But what I wanna argue is that, um, I don't think it's that simple, and, and I think there's some data that pushes back a little bit on the notion that the pan it's, it's all just the pandemic. Um, so first, uh, there's never really been much of a relationship between the business cycle and violence. 
Um, so actually crime declined during the Great Recession, violence declined during the Great Recession um, in, in 2008, uh, actually declined during the Great Depression in, in the 1930s. Um, and so while property crime follows the business cycle a bit, violent crime really doesn't. Violent crime is, is, is something that's not as connected to um, swings in the labor market as, as many believe. Um, as for the other stresses of the pandemic, you know, which, which hit the whole world, um, we've got to look around the world and acknowledge that the rise in violence in, in the U.S. is pretty unique. We don't see violence go up in Canada or Mexico. We don't see it go up in Western Europe, and we don't even see it go up in Latin America. Um, and, and actually, one really interesting data point is we don't see violence rise in, in Puerto Rico, which is, of course, part of the United States. Uh, violence actually declines in Puerto Rico. So there's lots of local factors, right, that you can point to and you can say, well, oh, I, I can understand maybe why violence wouldn't rise in Mexico or, or El Salvador. Um, but, you know, we do have to step back, I think, and recognize that the pandemic has been a source of great strain uh, all around the world, especially in poor countries. Um, you know, countries that, that have a lot of violence, countries that do have a lot of uh, access to guns. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about the fact that our social safety net is not nearly as good as what's offered in Western Europe, but it is certainly better, right, than what we see in, in Latin American countries. So, um, you know, I think the question that we have to be asking is why did violence go up in the U.S.? Why is this a, a uniquely American problem? Um, and so, you know, in, in thinking about this, right, we, we have to think about the events of May 25th and and the, you know, the killing of George Floyd by, by Derek Chauvin. Um, so this is another big theory that people have put forward that it's, it's the protests that caused the rise in violence. Um, and you know, so the protesters are, are calling for the police to be defunded. So when you just look at where, when the protests happened and when the homicide rates began to spike, there's a pretty you know, clear connection in time at least, right? That the violence really does go, go up around the time of the protests. Um, so is it the protests? Is it you know, defunding of police? Um, I think we can say a little bit about this. So with respect to defund, um, a few cities did meaningfully, meaningfully defund their police departments, but most cities didn't do that, right? And homicide rates rose fairly equally in both sets of cities. So it's, it's not the defunding of police departments. That really isn't something that happened very much in 2020. Um, and it's, it's very hard to think about that. Um, causing uh, what we've seen. Could it be the protests? Um, maybe. Uh, I don't think we can dismiss that out of hand. Um, but I, I don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think it's as simple as like, oh, the protests caused the violence, right? You really think about like why that might be. Um, so so here's, here's some data that I think pushes back a, a little bit on that idea. So around March 2020, when the police were pulling back and making fewer stops, they were starting to confiscate larger and larger numbers of guns. So the police are making 65% fewer stops and they're finding 300% more weapons uh, on people. And so people, what this means I think is that people were more likely to be carrying guns, right? Unless the police all of a sudden got really, really good at figuring out who had the guns in them. Um, and this happened before, um, you know, the horrible events of May 25th. Um, and so, you know, the, the you know, the key ingredient that set the stage for the rise in violence was already happening shortly after the pandemic began. And, you know, I think that pushes it back against this simple idea that the pandemic caused the violence. I think what we can maybe say is that the, uh, sorry, the protest caused the violence. I, I think what we can maybe say is that um, the protest made it harder for the police to regain control once the violence uh, began. The protests may have demoralized the police, uh, but it's hard for me to believe that the protests were really the spark when the gun carrying uh, began earlier. Um, so I'll try to be brief. I have two other quick theories I want to um, just talk about because they've, they've come up quite a bit. Uh, the first is progressive political reforms. Um, so these are reforms like um, uh, getting rid of money bail and um, reducing penalties for misdemeanor crimes. These are reforms that were being pushed in some cities prior to the pandemic. And so some people have said, well, it's not the pandemic, it's those reforms that are finally uh, having an impact. Um, you know, in my view, uh, that is an unlikely uh, major driver of what we see in 2020. Uh, basically, 
um, the pandemic is, is, you know, whatever it is, policing or the pandemic itself, you know, crime is going up everywhere, at least violent crime. And it's going up uh, about the same in cities that had more progressive reforms and in cities that had fewer progressive reforms. So I, I don't think that is, is a major driver. Uh, and then one other theory that people bring up is, is gun proliferation. Um, so basically uh, in 2020, there was a massive surge in gun purchases. Um, new background checks rose by 40%, um, which is the biggest rise in, in many years. Uh, I'm personally a little skeptical that this is a major driver. Could it be a, a driver to some extent? Sure. Um, and, and, and I'll just give you two reasons why. Um, so first, you know, if you think about the period from, uh, you know, let's say 2000 to 2014, um, more than 100 million new guns were purchased in the United States, well over 100 million, and, and murders went down. And if you look at the relationship between gun purchases and, and murder, there really isn't a national relationship between these two series. And, and the big reason for this is that uh, crime guns tend not to be new guns. So the guns used in crime are usually around 10 or 15 years old. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's easy to sort of say, well, you know, more guns in 2020, more, more homicides, mostly most of which are committed using guns. So that, that's clearly gotta be a driver. Um, I don't think it clearly has to be a driver. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, everything can contribute to some extent. This is very complex, but to me, it sounds more like a combination of the pandemic itself with um, issues related to policing and maybe police pulling back, maybe a lack of police legitimacy, things like that. No, I, I certainly appreciate that intellectual honesty. It's, it's pretty consistent with, um sort of the picture of complexity that I've seen. And I'm glad that you brought up uh, the data on other countries um, because it, it does seem to say that this is a uniquely American uh, problem with violent crime. Um, so I think given that we understand that it's unique to the US, um, that sort of uh, leads to my next question, which is what policy options are there um, what, what solutions are there for uh, mitigating violent crime? Um, because it seems like there's a lot of debate around what the causes are, but we actually do have some solutions that we can point to as, as being effective. Yeah, so we, we have information, right, about what's worked in the past to control crime. Um, you know, the, the thing is, a lot of that research was carried out during a period where crime was sort of um, falling or was at least uh, steady. So, you know, I think the big caveat here is we don't really know specifically what's going to work in the context of, you know, rapidly rising homicide rates. We have to just embrace, again, that there's going to be some uncertainty around this. Um, but, but broadly speaking, I would say we have uh, maybe three main options when it comes to controlling uh, violence. Um, and so first we can invest in law enforcement, right? Um, so this uh, could take on many forms. It might involve directing police officers to uh, return to a more proactive style of policing, making more street stops, making more arrests. Uh, it could mean investing more in police manpower and just um, making police more visible as a deterrent, focusing more police attention on the areas where crime uh, has risen the most or violence has risen the most. Um, it could target, uh, it could include the targeting of criminal gangs specifically, because we know that gangs and crews are major drivers of what we're seeing um, happen right now. Um, so that's sort of the law enforcement approach. Um, second, we could invest in community-led approaches, right? So we could think about funding for social services. Uh, it's a popular idea um, and there's some evidence behind it, right? Uh, we could think about community violence intervention where trained street workers uh, interface with um, local gang members and try to mediate conflict and offer social services to gang members to um, you know, maybe uh, induce them out of a way of life that, that uh, might lead to violence. Um, and so all this is, is another option on the table. Um, a third option that maybe gets a little bit less attention but I think is worth thinking about as well is focusing on the built environment. Um, so things like greening vacant lots, fixing up abandoned buildings, reducing disorder and, and adding street lighting. Um, there's um, definitely some evidence that disorder begets disorder. Um, and so that's another strategy. And, and I think, frankly, all of these should be on the table, right? Um, you know, the, the causes of, of crime are complex and, the, and so the solutions probably should be complex and multifaceted uh, as well. Sure. 
Um, and I guess thinking through uh, these three options, um, it seems like the uh, violent crime rates, as you mentioned the, at the beginning, are sort of uneven just based on the city, the size of the city, um, even sort of the density of, of the location. So um, thinking about where the spikes are happening or is there one option that's maybe more, um, not just effective, but appropriate um, given uh, the level of crime? Yeah, so I, I definitely can speak to, um, you know, what we know about what works, at least looking backward and, you know, what we still, you know, maybe are less certain about. Uh, but one thing I, I want to say up front and, and sort of in response to the way you phrased the question is that, you know, it might be a different mix of strategies that should be used in, in different cities, right? Like, I think one thing that seems very, very important to me is that we should not have a national violence reduction strategy, right? I think the people with the most skin in the game should be deciding how they wanna go about this, right? And that means in particular, people who live in the communities that are experiencing the most violence should be the people whose voices are heard here, right? You know, do we want more police? Do we wanna invest in social services more? Do we wanna have some kind of mix of those two things? Um, you know, what makes sense in Salt Lake City might make less sense in Detroit, right? So, um, you know, I think local leaders and, and skin in the game um, feels to me like something um, that we should we should be thinking hard about. Um, that said, you know, I, I can certainly talk to sort of the, the national evidence here. Um, and I'll start with law enforcement. So, um, you know, we do know that investments in law enforcement do um, uh, uh, help to maintain public safety. Uh, when cities hire more police, uh, crime goes down, uh, including uh, homicides. Um, when you send more police to, to crime hotspots, crime goes down. When police are pulled away from their beats uh, because they have to respond to a traffic accident or something like that, crime goes up, right? So um, the idea that you know crime is just something that happens because of root causes and police make no difference, uh, I think is not an idea that's supported um, by the research that's been done. Now, investments in policing don't automatically uh, lead to improvements in crime. It really depends on what the police do. Um, but broadly speaking, um, you know, this is a strategy that's got to be on the table um, because we do have evidence um, for it. Um, now, you know, when you think about all the different approaches that police can take, right? So, so one approach is sort of mass stop question and frisk, right? You send an army of rookie cops out into the community and you tell them make a lot of stops, make a lot of arrests. And if you're not doing that, you're gonna get in trouble. Um, that is not an approach uh, for which we have good evidence, right? Like uh, that, that doesn't seem to be something that, that is a great way to improve public safety. It's also uh, not a great way to improve police community relations. Um, so you know, my reading of, of the data is that that's probably not what we wanna be doing. Um, at the same time, um, you know, uh, when police don't feel empowered to make stops at all, um, and when they're, they don't feel empowered to do good proactive policing, um, there's evidence that that's an environment that, you know, that can be conducive to a rise in crime. So there's research that shows when there's a viral, a viral video or a viral crime incident, and then there's a federal investigation, the police pull back, right? They make fewer stops and arrests, and then violence does, does increase, right? Most of the street stops the police make or have made in the past, especially under these mass enforcement regimes are not productive stops, right? You're just stopping some random guy who's doing nothing wrong. But some of these stops I think have great public safety value and you want those stops to still be made. Um, so I think that's uh, something that, that is important to think about when it comes to policing. Um, there's also some evidence that a laser focus on criminal gangs can matter a lot. So, so something that's not well known is that in New York City, the homicide rate declined by 50% between 2011 and 2019. So up until the pandemic, New York was experiencing this like second great crime decline that other cities just weren't experiencing. And in the background is the fact that a federal court ruling happened in 2013 and the police uh, started making many, many fewer street stops. So the police are, are making fewer stops and the homicide rate is going way down. And so why is that? How is that possible? Well, what the NYPD began doing, and this is in, in partnership with the, the local district attorney's offices, is really beefing up their anti-gang unit, 
um, engaging in large scale gang raids and going after people who are known to carry guns and known to um, be involved in shootings. And there's research, some of it by me, that, that suggests um, that this was a major driver uh, as to why homicides went down in New York City during this time. So, you know, we know that it's a small number of people in, in, in you know, disadvantaged communities that are, are carrying guns and involved in a lifestyle that creates uh, lethal violence. And, you know, I think it's right that if the police can go in and, you know, address those people, um, you really can see big reductions in crime without more and more street stops and more and more arrests and an ever widening of the net of the criminal justice system. Um, so, so that's, I think, a broad overview of, of the public safety approach and what we know has worked and what, what really hasn't. Um, when it comes to social services, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence here that things like providing summer jobs to, to at-risk kids can reduce crime, that programs that deliver cognitive behavioral therapy to kids um, and teach, teach them to sort of slow down your thinking. If someone insults you, you, you don't have to pull out that weapon. Um, these things you know, have evidence behind them. Um, there's also uh, uh, research that shows that just in general, when nonprofits receive more funding in a community, uh, crime reductions follow. So um, there's certainly evidence that investments in, in communities uh, matter too. Uh, now, there is one um, community uh, intervention that, that I think is sort of um, the elephant in the room right now, which is community violence intervention, um, sort of violence interrupters, uh, sending um, street workers um, into areas with gangs to do outreach and to try to cool down the temperature and prevent a retaliatory murder. Um, this is actually a, an approach that's been around for many, many years, maybe even like 100 years. It used to be the dominant approach to dealing with gangs. Um, prior to let's say the, the 1970s. Um, and it's a really attractive idea, right? Because it's a way for the community to um, produce public safety on its own without the need for more policing. And if that can be accomplished, like that's wonderful, right? Um, you know, policing has benefits, it also has costs. Um, you know, the, the, the problem is the evidence behind this idea is very, very mixed at, at best. Um, so. Um, some of these evaluations show that these programs have worked, uh, but most uh, don't show that, and a few have even shown some backfire effects. Um, you know, the um, complicating factor here is that the quality of the research designs um, in general hasn't been that good. So, um, you know, we really don't know overall how effective these programs have been. Um, and so overall, I think my view here is that um, we, we should continue to invest in this stuff, right? Because if it works, it could be, um, you know, just incredible um, if we can find a formula that works. Um, you know, that said, uh, you know, this stuff really depends a lot on, on, on strong implementation. Uh, you really do have to worry, you know, how well can this be scaled? Like if I find one great program that, that's great because they have an amazing leader, um, well, it's not like there's amazing leaders everywhere who, who know how to do this work. Um, and so I think that's one reason to be a little bit cautious. And so, you know, I, I just think at this moment in time, this should not be the center of anyone's uh, violence, um, anti-violence uh, strategy, or at least not if that strategy is intended to be evidence-based. We just, we don't have an evidentiary basis for making strong claims about this approach um, right now. Uh, and then a third approach um, is just that um, dealing with the built environment. Um, so today, when we think about broken windows policing, um, you know, that's been synonymous with very excessive police tactics. Um, but a big part of the original theory of broken windows policing is the broken window itself, right? Um, that when you have disorderly conditions, um, you know, these are conditions that ordinary citizens um, don't feel as inviting. They don't want to go out and walk around the street. They feel, um, they feel afraid. And people who, you know, might be um, intent on committing crimes, uh, you know, might be empowered in a, in a, in a um, situation like that. So there's actually very good evidence here from randomized uh, experiments, um, things like cleaning up abandoned buildings uh, and vacant lots, improving street lighting and just reducing trash and disorder can reduce crime in the community, including violence. Um, and so, you know, I, th that I think should not be um, lost here. So to sort of sum this up, um, you know, crime is complex, uh, and so we probably need uh, an approach to fighting crime that draws on 
um, all of these things, right? You, you, you want to empower and equip police departments to be able to root out the criminal gangs that are driving a lot of the violence, right? You know, there's a narrative that I think holds a lot of water that, that black communities are both under policed and over policed, right? That they, they don't get enough of that important crime reduction stuff, but they get too much of the excessive policing. And so, you know, you want police to be empowered and equipped to, to deal with the crime problems in, in a community and deal with them surgically uh, with the scalpel, not with like trying to think whatever the opposite of a scalpel is, like a hammer or something like that. Um, you know, we also need community investment, right? Without strong communities, the police are always going to be playing, you know, whack-a-mole, right? And, and, you know, crime is never really going to go away. Um, and, and so that's also an uh, important approach. And, and so I think what, what I sort of wish here is that we could all um, back away a little bit from our, our partisan corners and, and stop thinking of police as the conservative approach and, and community investment as the liberal approach. Um, these are things that really should be working hand in hand. And when you look to the survey evidence and you ask people in communities where violence is rising, um, poor communities, what do you want? Um, most people say we want more police and we want more social services, right? I think people are acknowledging that, um, and we want better police, right? We want better police. We, we, you know, we want the kind of policing that people get um, in, in, in the suburbs. Uh, so, you know, I think people are, you know, telling us that they value a balanced approach to this. No, that's really interesting. And I guess um, thinking about that, what's next in terms of your own research? What are you uh, looking at um, uh, just sort of going forward? Yeah, so I remain very interested in studying um, uh, sort of targeted gang enforcement approaches. Um, you know, I, I found in New York City that these uh, this kind of approach had a big effect. And, and the really nice thing is you know, when, when the police would do a major gang raid around a public housing unit in New York, uh, shootings went down by about a third, and that effect lasted for about 18 months. And street stops didn't go up, and arrests didn't go up, right, uh, in the aftermath. So it feels like a way, potentially, to, you know, address the problem of serious violence. So, so these gang raids didn't reduce sort of less serious crimes, but they reduced the serious violent crimes that people care the most about. Um, without just driving up more police enforcement, sending more people to jail. And of course, when people go to jail, it just further criminalizes people. Like, you know, we all know that these are big problems. Um, and, you know, you, you want to empower police, um, you know, to do this really valuable stuff, right? And I think gang raids are, are potentially a way to do that. Um, you know, having said that, um, that's also an approach that you wonder, could it be scaled well? Like maybe uh, the policymakers in New York did a great job of this. And, um, you know, it turns out when you try to do this in other cities, you get more excessive policing and, and, and just not as much of the good stuff. Um, you know, so, you know, if I could reference The Wire, uh, maybe I'm starting to date myself at this point. Um, no, I've seen know, it. I've seen it. So <laughs> Hopefully, and if anyone's listening and, and you haven't seen The Wire, you should go out and watch The Wire. It's a, it's a, it's a fine show. Um, but, you know, in The Wire, right, there's a big emphasis uh, on, on good policing, right, on really doing the investigation and getting the guys who are doing the violence and not just like going in and arresting a bunch of small time dealers and, and saying, you know, all right, let's call it a day. Um, so I, I'm, I'm definitely interested in more research along those lines. With respect to the causes of what happened in 2020, one of the things that I've thought more about is, you know, when you think about the rise in violence in you know, in, in, in certain communities, how much of that is just more violence among the pre-existing networks of people who are already involved in the violence and how much of this is new entrants, right? So I think anecdotally, what we hear, right, is that people realize it's an arms, an arms race out there. So, you know, I don't wanna be carrying a gun, right? But I'm gonna carry a gun because I know other people are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to what extent is this, you know, getting new people involved really don't want to be. And to what extent is it just this, you know, the usual suspects uh, driving this? Um, if it's the usual suspects, then I think it's easier for police to deal with this. Um, if not, then it's a little bit harder, right? The more diffuse the problem is, the harder it is for policing um, to do this in a surgical way. So um, those are some things that I'm thinking about, uh, but, um, you know, uh, so it's a big world of researchers out there and, um, you know, hopefully in the next
couple of years, we'll, we'll start to learn um, you know, what works to control violence when violence is rising. And, and hopefully we'll see that 2020 and 2021 was just a blip. Well, thank you, Aaron. This has been a, a fascinating discussion and I uh, really appreciate you making the time to uh, join me um, for our podcast. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing your future writing and research on these topics and we'll link to some of them in the, in the webpage um, for people who wanna read more, but thank you. Thanks, Veronica, my, my pleasure.